The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Agile is the 21st Century Compliance. We are, uh, we apologize profusely for the problems we had yesterday. They turned out to be internet connection problems uh, that we couldn't recover from. Um, we, we are building additional redundancy. So this doesn't happen again. So it's, that's one of those uh, lessons learned. We thought we had it covered, and, and we didn't. But we know how to get it covered now. Uh, anyway, my name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lines Publishing, the publisher of the Hitler Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. A couple of housekeeping items. We are a small group today of the dedicated and faithful that have come back. Uh, and so you should, uh, a couple things we're going to do to reward uh, your return is I'm presenting today about Agile, a, a compliance methodology. And I can tell you one of the reasons if you're a compliance professional you ought to be interested is that the compliance <laughs> job market is really, really hot right now. And I think the job market is going to stay hot for a while. And I think uh, although you may have never heard of Agile Compliance, I think you're going to be hearing more and more. Uh, and as we go through the presentation, I'm going to make the argument as to why you're going to be hearing more and more about Agile Compliance. And then actually introduce you to the HIPAA Survival Guide's uh, compliance. But in addition to that, um, because we're such a small group, and if you have um, questions that have nothing to do with Agile, during the presentation or in the Q&A, we're going to do an uh, ask, uh, ask me anything type session. So you, you have this question that's been burning and you want it, need to get an answer to. You don't need to wait to the formal Q&A. You can let it rip, and I will answer as we go. We'll have a, uh, a conversation. So with that, uh, we're going to cover the learning objectives, a little background, why Agile is 21 century compliance. Assess, simplify, protect, monitor, report. That's a um, life cycle of risk ma of your risk management program is the best way I could put it. And it's a, a recursive, never-ending life cycle. We're going to talk about uh, why that is. Some definitions for our methodology and how we use Agile to both uh, build and deliver our products for the HIPAA survival guide and to practice law. So you can think of Agile as being a widespread sort of project management methodology philosophy. It um, started somewhat in the software industry. It's being used for business planning and a thousand different things now. It really has to do with iterative thinking. Uh, it is now um, sort of related to the concept of wicked problems uh, and, and why wicked problems need an agile methodology. So you're going to be hearing a lot about agile in a lot of different contexts. We're just bringing it to compliance. So Martin, you can, since we're going to do an Ask Me Anything, you can, uh, whenever you get a question, you can interrupt and uh, we can go from there. So what are we going to cover today? We want to provide a foundational understanding of HSG's agile compliance methodology What's the end game? Agile, repeatable, verifiable risk management. You know, we talk about the rules. We, we often do talk about the specifics of the rules. But at the end of the day, your compliance program is a risk management program. Uh, and underneath that is the privacy rule, security rule, the breach notification rule, et cetera. That's sort of the umbrella. And so Agile really addresses the whole ball of wax, including governance. Uh, we're going to review the key definition of the, the grammar of the methodology, right? Uh, and it's really lightweight, which is um, consistent with Agile. Agile methodologies are flexible uh, and lightweight, so they're easy to learn. They don't become this sort of, or, or they shouldn't become this sort of religion, although sometimes in, in, in other industries they have. The focus is... Um, on getting things done. And so we're going to have some examples today. Seeing and doing is really what Agile is about. And talk about getting things done and compliance, often with a team of one. Obviously, um, 
that's not quite true. That team of one has to, uh, no matter how small the practice, will have to reach out to HIT consultants, will have to reach out to the executives uh, of the practice and other stakeholders. Uh, but often it's that lone privacy officer and security officer uh, for small practices, and you have to figure out how you're going to get things done uh, and how you're going to include, uh, actually build the team, sometimes maybe in a stealth mode. At the end of the day, what we want to do is provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of what immediate steps can be taken to launch your agile compliance program. So uh, traction, that's what we really want to talk about. So here's, here's uh, the High Tech Act container, and this is sort of the container also for your risk management program largely. You know, this is, this is your universal privacy rule, the security rule that obviously has been around for a while, and the breach notification rule, the 800-pound gorilla that was introduced by the High Tech Act. Uh, and as part of our iterative methodology, you know, we've been writing about this in our newsletters for a long, long time. Um, and so Agile is not something uh, new. It's just we packaged it and sort of formalized it a little bit better. If you have no story, it really means that you pump your nose at the law, you haven't done anything since the High Tech Act came out, which is now, what, five years ago. Uh, and you're, you certainly then don't have a good compliance narrative. And by good compliance story, we mean the, the ability of your organization, or if you, some of you are consultants, uh, your client's organization, to demonstrate visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. And it's something that's, that they're going to get better and better at over time the fact that no one is going to be 100% compliant ever, probably, but at least on day one when you get started is something that is well understood by HHS. What you want to do is be able to make a good faith argument that you're not in willful neglect land, in no story land, because that's the place where the biggest fines are. And fully compliant really is an aspirational goal. So. There's a good chance that a lot of covered entities and, and business associates don't have a story or relying on that three ring binder prior to the High Tech Act. That's not going to get it done. Uh, and most organizations, for reasons that we can talk about, are likely never to be fully compliant because what we have here is a moving target. Either the regs are moving, your operational environment are moving, or as we're going to go through today, there's so much disruption in the healthcare industry with mergers and acquisitions and so forth, the different business models being uh, uh, um, experimented with, that you're never going to get to this sort of static state where uh, you're fully compliant. The state that you, I would, help, I would hope you, you would get to is that you have a damn good compliance story, a damn good narrative that you could show an auditor, a court of law, et cetera. So what are we trying to do? Well, there's a couple of objectives at 100,000 feet. One is at the end of the day, this whole exercise is to reduce risk to a level that is reasonable and appropriate. And I like to say that reasonable and appropriate are the weasel words in the rules that uh, HHS or court could use to have the thing mean anything, you know, what's, you know, minimum necessary or, you know, the security rule is full of this reasonable and appropriate measures. But you can also use the weasel words to your advantage. In other words, you're not going to eliminate all risk. That's an impossibility. So in order to make a good faith argument, your good faith argument has to be targeted at or should be targeted at, did you do what was reasonable and appropriate? for an organization of your size, et cetera, right? And those, that, that comports with the flexibility principle of the security rule, right? You can take into account uh, your practice's uh, uh, financial state, resources, technical ability, et cetera. Now, with that, you still can't ignore the rule, and you can't even ignore addressable requirements. But that's the, the goal, the objective is to reduce risk to a level that is reasonable and appropriate. And as a practical matter, you're trying to constrain or proof your practice. Now, as an example, uh, now, Martin, I run a virtual law firm. Martin and I are not in the same building. He had Internet connection problems. I didn't. 
okay, and but a lack of an internet connection in in most practices probably, and if you have your EHR system on the cloud, any single point of failure like that in your debt, right? And so, you know, we've been discussing. Uh, this is a rare occurrence, but when it happens, it's bad. It'll ruin your day. So, you know, there are alternate, uh, way, alternate cheap ways to get connections. The, the problem is 99% of the year or the time, you're not going to use it. But that 1% is probably going to save your day, right? And that might be anything from having a webinar to filing something in court, you know, etc. Now, my backup is to go to other hot locations nearby where I know I can get a connection. But the reality of the matter is it's probably prudent for me just to make the additional investments. I don't have to go anywhere. I have that backup when I need it. Now, that's what we're trying to do is Katrina proof your practice. A lot of this is, you know, from, from a security rule perspective, is really IT 101, except the healthcare industry being the healthcare industry is so far behind that as we'll see, they're going through 150 years of change in five that they've never gotten to this 101 part, okay? And I think just being able to get to the 101 part may be enough to avoid a finding of willful neglect. So although there's a ton of complexity, you don't need to solve it all uh, at the start. So why Agile? Well, most projects fail because of people and process challenges. Really, they have very little to do with the underlying technologies. It's not the technologies and the complexity of the technologies that make projects fail. It's the complex, the social complexity of the organization that make projects fail. You didn't get buy-in. You, you know, you didn't talk to uh, the docs enough. You ignored the nurses. There's a million and one organizational ways that uh, that these technology projects can go wrong. And some of the horror stories. Uh, that you read about with EHR implementations that have gone south, I, I can almost bet you 99.95% .95 of the time it was an organizational reason that it went south, not a failure of the software uh, itself. So an iterative agile methodology is required, and we're going to try to answer what exactly that is. That's the intent of this presentation today. So. Agile compliance is what? Okay, so I'm just going to run through this litany, and at the end, we're going to simplify it even more. Agile compliance is a group of methods based on an iterative incremental approach where compliance solutions evolve through collaboration between cross-functional teams. In other words, you don't form a committee to form a committee to name a committee to study the problem to death. You start working on a solution your compliance solution, and that solution is going to evolve over time. Agile promotes adaptive planning, evolutionary development and implementation, and time box iterative approach. What does that mean? That means that, uh, and we're, we're going to get to this as, as we uh, look at our, what we're calling our chunks, is that you should take small pieces and get them done. And that's how you eat this elephant one bite at a time. If you try to map out the entire elephant, you get so overwhelmed that you, you're in analysis paralysis land, all right? And so we, we have some sample chunks that you take, and you get this chunk done and that chunk done, and then we the methodology also has a way to tie back those chunks back to the requirements of the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, so that if an auditor walked in or your boss walked in after a breach or a court of law wants to see, you actually have a way that you can report where you're at. What's your progress? You can track it. Agile is the conceptual, a conceptual framework. You're not going to see two agile implementations across any organizations that are the same. That's true in the software industry. It's true because agile is is dealing with social, partly dealing with the social complexity. Um, and agile. Finally, we think that agile compliance is how an organization. How any organization goes about changing its compliance DNA. If you're going to, if you're going to play in this new space, you know, and you're going to create what what HHS has been uh, using the phrase a culture of compliance. You really have to rethink uh, how you 
do compliance within your organization. Now, I got, I got to tell you that, uh, you know, this is brand new to most of healthcare because, it, it, you know, it was a HIPAA, HIPAA enforcement prior to the High Tech Act was the dirty little secret that everybody knew. It wasn't enforced. It was really a dead letter, so you could do whatever you wanted to do because there was really no consequences. So whatever you were doing before never got vetted. And now your world is completely changed because you have reached like Target, Neiman Marcus, you know, cyber war, Washington is paying attention. And this is just not your daddy's HIPAA anymore. And so for the first time, you really have to tackle, all right, how are we going to deal with this as an organization? This is partly what um, partly what we're trying to provide an answer for, which is agile is how you go about doing that. And this is uh, how you can um, best summarize Agile. This is fail forward fast. Go ahead and get started. Make some mistakes because, because it's the only effective way of solving a wicked problem. And by wicked, we mean hard, not evil, although there's a lot of people out there that think um, high-tech HIPAA um, is evil, is evil, but we're talking about complexity, wicked problems. And a wicked problem is one that has the following characteristics. You don't really understand the problem until you started developing the solution. The problem is not just let me get me get let me let me get these thirty templates and fill in the blank and then I'm done. And all of you, I am sure, have experienced that one way or the other, right? There is no PFM button out there or no easy button. That's not the way uh, you're going to get it done. There's no stopping rule. There's no that, there's no rule that says exactly where you're when you're done since there's no really definitive problem other than we have to comply with HIPAA. Now that that's the problem but that's that's not very useful as far as giving you a prescription at, as to how to move forward. So solutions are not right or wrong, they're just better, worse, good enough. This is not like building a bridge that we know how to do the the the, cal the engineering calculations, you know, the same problem we've solved a hundred times Every wicked problem is unique and novel. Every solution is a one-shot operation. I'm going to take a breath here and see if anybody's got a question related to Agile, related to anything you might want to ask. Well, so we don't have any questions at this point, but hopefully okay, so someone will get to it. Big problems require small solutions. That's another way to think about Agile. The, the, the complexity involved here in actually covering the rules is a, is a big, big problem, but you're only going to get there by implementing small solutions. Okay, And that's what we're going to talk about today is how those small solutions work. But the best advice and the best <clears throat> way that you want to think about is you got to get started. Okay, And I'm going to talk a little bit about the old compliance universe and old compliance sort of managers and what they looked at and why that is not going to hold going <clears> forward. <throat> and if you want to participate in what is going to be an explosively hot market, I think over the next 10 years, like anything else, you want to, you, you need to master the lingo uh, before you can get in the game because if you can't speak the lingo, then everybody knows you're an outsider. All right? And so this is part of... Um, really a, a part of a, a, a paradigm shift, that's an overused word, in compliance. So this is not old school compliance. It's radically different from that. Old school compliance was sort of this governance, risk management, compliance, with, you know, compliance being this necessary evil that you had to take care of, you know. And yes, you had people processing platform. That was this sort of, you know, linear sort of thinking about how you went about doing it, okay. It was kind of a formal academic model, it was a static model, risk as a necessary evil to be contained. Okay? I'm proposing that compliance is something that's part of your value proposition, part of what you do uh, to, that enhances the customer ex experience. Privacy and security compliance is built into the day-to-day, -day, your day-to-day -day operations so that you went, so that when you encounter customer or patient touch points, there um, you, you're adding value because of how you're complying, how you're dealing with their PHI. And now, you know, we're seeing a huge push 
from the consumer end, the e, the e patient, e patient Dave, and the empowered patient, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. The, the, the more widespread availability of pro personal health records and EHRs, we're never going back. Nobody's talking about repealing the High Tech Act. The C, the the C uh, change has already occurred. It doesn't really matter what Washington does. This is out of Washington's hands right now. And so the fact that consumers are changing their behavior, and you got 80 million boomers about to retire, you're going to see uh, a, a lot of people demanding their uh, their PHI. And how you respond to that is going to reflect on your reputation, your bottom line, et cetera, et cetera. So you should see compliance now not as a necessary evil, but as a potential value add. And this is a, again, a Tom Peters quote, is that this soft stuff that looks like soft stuff, it's the hard stuff. You get this stuff wrong, you're not going to get any of the rest of it right. You know, the, the rest of it uh, can only be right if you get this soft stuff right up front, if you get the methodology right, the approach right. Um, and why? So I'm going to just put, put, throw out there that disruption happens. If any, it, you know, it, I'm sure... Uh, all of you have been paying attention, more or less, what's been happening in the healthcare industry over the last five years. I'm just going to run through this litany because this is just the beginning, right? Electronic health records and meaningful use and the whole push for a, a national healthcare infrastructure. Pay for performance, so fee for service is dead. We're going to pay for outcomes, managing populations, not disease management. That's that's not going, we're not going back to the old world no matter what happens to the Affordable Care Act, okay? The world has changed. ICD-10 and having to implement that. The Affordable Care Act obviously embodies a lot of these things I just put up here. Quality measures, actually uh, having to report quality measures and transparency, pricing transparency, mobile health, bring your own device. These are all things that are causing massive disruptions in the, in the healthcare industry, and there's no end in sight. Clearly, there's going to be mergers and acquisitions and consolidation. I just read a report where the big, uh, I think 12 of the big blues formed a partnership with the U UK, and I'm sure all of you know that the, uh, that, that, uh, the United Kingdom has socialized medicine. It's, it's a national system. These 12 big blues have partnered with uh, one of the, one of those providers, and and you're going to see this, this global sort of scale. I mean, if nothing else, uh, think of the purchasing power that's uh, behind a move like that. So you're going to see a lot more uh, mergers and acquisitions, telemedicine, and all these things that we're talking about have an impact on compliance. Compliance touches all these things. So as your world is changing, you got to be thinking about how does compliance change and how does compliance fit into that? So the healthcare industry is experiencing 150 years of change in five. You know, in my lifetime, I've been through a lot of change. I've seen a lot of change. I was in the tech industry back in the dot com um, era before I started practicing law. You know, the tech, the, the technology industry has seen a ton of disruption. Okay, obviously the print uh, news media has seen a not 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 just disruption but uh, ob obliteration that that industry just disappeared but I've really never seen anything like the amount of change that's going on in the healthcare industry right now and is going to continue for our lifetime this is this is this this new model whatever it is is going to take another 50 years to perfect so the pace of innovation is accelerating and there's we're, we're all competing in time now, right? We're all competing in internet time, and that's why having an agile, flexible, responsive methodology is important uh, in a lot of things, and it's important in compliance as well. So this is uh, a little model here called the S-curve model uh, that deals with sort of how innovation happens, and there's the birth of a new product or services, the product catches on, and you see high growth, you get to a point where there's maximum productivity, and then you sort of flatline. You know, a, a, a organization matures. You become Microsoft. You're not innovating anymore. You're, you, you're, you still have a huge business, but you're having a hard time trying to get to that next curve. Now, as it turns out, there's very few companies 
that can actually get to that next curve of innovation. Apple is one. Apple had a, a near-death experience. Uh, Steve Jobs uh, brought it back from the dead, and Apple did make it to the next curve, and Apple's probably uh, trying to make sure that it doesn't flatline and doesn't get on the next curve. There's, IBM had a near-death experience when Microsoft damn near put it out of business. But the bottom line is most organizations can't make the shift, and there's a death spiral after some point in time, which all plays into the fact that there's going to be a ton of change. There's going to be a lot of players coming in, coming out, etc. And this is not going to stop any time in our lifetime, right? So that's that's the nature of the problem. That's the kind of change that is happening in the healthcare industry, and there's just no end to it in society. So what's the response from a compliance perspective, right? That's the topic of today. And so we introduced this Assess, Simplify, Protect, Monitor report. That's really our methodology for our risk management uh, program. And the risk management program is embodied, embodied in the administrative safeguards security rules second implementation specification that says risk management. And uh, we've done a webinar on risk management alone. And risk management, I like to say, really swallows the rules. It swallows the security rule. It swallows the privacy rule. It swallows the breach notification rule. And that's where we started. Everything you're, you're really doing is part of your risk management program. At the end of the day, if you're a compliance professional, that's really what you're doing. You're implementing a risk management program, and what we're providing here is a way to have an agile risk management program. But at the end of the day, because each agile implementation is going to be different, because each organization is different, agile is really what you say it is. It's how you iterate. Yeah, you, there's a few uh, basic principles that translate across organizations, but at the end of the day, each organization is going to iterate slightly different from the next. So here's some key definitions that we're going to go through and then give you some examples of what we're talking about. A track means a rate, a set of related chunks. And you can think of chunks as many project plans. Okay? Tracks go on indefinitely, potentially, meaning that the work in a track is continuous over time. There is technically no end to a track. Okay? Track, tracks may be comprised of different chunks depending on what makes the most business sense for your organization. Because this is agile, we're not, even though we're going to make some recommended uh, tracks and some recommended chunks, these may not fit quite with the way your organization works. But because this is agile, take the philosophy, modify it, and create your own tracks and chunks that line up better with your current organization, because you may be working with an organization that's got nothing. You may, may be working with an organization that thinks it's got a really mature program, except it's got a really mature program for compliance the way it was 10 years ago. You know, hey, that's not going to work uh, any longer. So what is a chunk? A chunk is a means a set of related compliance tasks and the smallest unit of visible demonstrable evidence of compliance. You're actually, you complete a chunk, you're actually delivering something. And the whole thing about Agile is, that these chunks should be completed in two or three weeks, or they can go as low as three days to 20 days, but they're really defined to get something done within a small, short period of time. Now, yes, they are part of a bigger plan. You got to do lots of chunks to make specific progress, but you don't, the idea is not to get caught in this analysis paralysis mode. So chunks, how are they estimated as far as effort? Char chunks are estimated based on the amount of effort necessary to complete the individual tasks that make up the chunk. We're going to see some examples of tasks and chunks here in, in a second, including any documentation required for the chunk. The outcomes of each chunk should be reflected back into the H2 scorecard. And here we, we're referring to our scorecard, which for the privacy rule and the security rule has listed every single one of the requirements. We have a checklist on how you comply with every single one of the requirements, which, which policy statements you should have, what processes you should have, and how you should track results. Okay? But even having these tools, customers are overwhelmed by the magnitude of the problem. Okay? And so chunks are saying, you know what? You should, you should feel somewhat overwhelmed because it's a really, really wicked problem. 
here's some ways that you can start get started. Just do this chunk, and then do this chunk, and then do this chunk. And you do enough of that, you're going to learn enough about how it works that hopefully you can get to that good compliance story, at least the beginning of that good compliance story, sooner rather than later. And the task is the most atomic verb-based on based verb-based action of compliance activity. A task is something that gets done, right? It's a verb. We're going to do something and contribute to the completion of the chunk. Note, tasks are estimated as the number of person hours that the compliance team often will be the team one thinks it will take to complete the task. So since, since these many project plans are not that big, it shouldn't be that hard to give a reasonable estimate on what it's going to take to complete this particular task. The difficulty, as we'll see, is that completion of that particular task really a lot of times is going to depend on the rest of the organization. So it's not going to be you, uh, the person driving it, that is going to be holding it up, but, uh, but the organization itself. And if nothing else, it will help you, it will help you make that problem visible so that when your boss comes back and asks you for the, the, you know, the top doc or whoever it is that you report to, the CFO, you can say, well, here's what we've been trying to do, and here's what we haven't gotten from X, Y, and Z. And so, but you'll have a visible way to, to show that. We've done these chunks. These chunks have some problems because, you know, we're, because we can't schedule training for everybody or whatever, whatever the problem happens to be. What's a requirement? A requirement means something that has to be done and that's mandated by a statute or regulation. So in our um, subscription plan, our set of products and our program, we have the security rule checklist, the privacy rule checklist, breach notification. Those, co those cover every single one of the requirements. And then chunks are how requirements get done. Okay, that's basically the relationship. So a requirement may have one or more chunks associated with it, but generally, almost always will be contained within a track. I'll show you what that means in a second. The scorecards are a way to show how you're completing requirements. You complete this requirement. After every chunk, you should be able to go back to the scorecard and say, you know what? Yes. Now we have a basic implementation. We're not done, but we got started on this particular requirement. And that, again, gives you a... Um, metaphor for how you report out. What's the status? Well, we've completed these chunks. We've addressed these requirements. We have these requirements to go. It's a way you can report out to your boss. It's a way you can report out to an auditor. It's a way you can report out to a uh, court of law that shows that you are making a good faith argument, uh, a good faith effort at compliance. Okay, because you can actually demonstrate what you've done and where you're at. You may not be in full compliance, and you're never going to be in full compliance, right? So that's not the real objective. The real objective is at least to get you out of willful neglect land where you're not getting 50000 per violation type fine is to be able to make a good faith argument that you are making progress. Okay? So... This gets back to the compliance continuum. It starts with an organization that doesn't have any compliance narrative at all. They're in willful neglect plan, all right, vis-a-vis -vis the High Tech Act and the omnibus rules. So yet that three-ring binder that you got six years ago, that ain't going to help you. And slowly moving to a good compliance narrative over time. Now, we hope to improve that slowly and do that quicker by getting you started faster and so that you can, with some tools, so that you can see exactly where the problems lie and you're not you're not looking at this blank sheet of paper. Uh, and finally matures into an organization approaching but never actually reaching full compliance. So our predefined set of tracks and chunks are designed to move you quickly from no story to the beginning of a good compliance narrative. Okay? And teach you along the way how you build that good compliance narrative over time. So, and it also ties back to the compliance equation because if you have a policy, and this is this is what our our checklists do, it takes every requirement of the security rule, it takes every requirement of the privacy rule, and says, okay, here's your policy statement. Here are the processes that you should implement that underpin this policy, and here's how you should track results. And if you have policies, processes, and results tracking per a requirement 
then you have visible demonstrable evidence that you've met that requirement. If you have a policy and no processes, all you have is, the, is a flowery language. You don't have anything. If you have the processes but can't show process results, then it, it's better than not having the processes, but what is an auditor going to want to see at the end of the day? If, for the training requirement, show me your training policy. Okay, I see you have this policy. Okay, talk, talk to me about your processes. Is it classroom training? Is it video-based training? Is it online training? How does that work? Okay, well, show me the results. Show me the last time that this particular nurse got trained for, you know, what, social media privacy. Whatever happens to me, show me the results. If you can't show the results, then, you know, you haven't gotten very far, right? So you need to be able to have all three per a requirement to show visible demonstrable evidence. Now, again, in our universe, that starts with a checklist. The methodology is how to get into the, how to start executing so that you can start getting some of the recent requirements complete. A policy, a policy is a purposeful, a pur purposeful set of decisions or actually usually in response to requirement, again, driven by the law. You have a policy, hey, we got to do this because the law mandates a process. There's a repeatable series of steps that are accomplished over time and the mechanism by which a policy is implemented. So the result, what's the result? The result is the electronic manifestation that a process has been executed over time. Show me the training spreadsheet over time so that I can tell who's been trained. Okay, no, so an example, training. Training is a great uh, example because everybody can kind of understand that. Show me the results of your training and I will buy that you have visible demonstrable evidence of training. If you can't show me the results, I'm not going to buy it. What does a run mean? Well, we have chunks that we set are like mini, G, mini project plans. A run means the amount of time in person days that it takes to complete one or more chunks. Sometimes if the chunks are small enough, you can put some two or three together and say this is going to be a run. Usually this ranges from two to three weeks, 10 to 15 person days, but it can be as little as three days, as much as 20. Remember that the completion time of a chunk is estimated by the aggregate of the amount of time it takes to complete each task in the chunk. Here's the thing, though. Because you have a short time frame, don't become obsessed or get hung up with perfecting your ability to estimate the run. Just get focused on, complete, on completing the chunks that make up the run, and that's how you'll complete the run, right? You'll get better at estimating, but you're not, you're not, um, you don't have to have a perfect estimate if you're, if you're off by a couple of days on the chunk, that's not going to make or break anything. If you do it a little bit faster, all the better, right? right? But the bottom line is complete the runs because at the end of the run, you're going to have a, a deliverable that you can tie back to a requirement in the HIPAA compliance scorecard. So we have predefined four track categories. Okay, foundation, these are the chunks that you attack first to get your organization to the start of a good compliance story. It's the bedrock, really, upon which your compliance program rests. Core, the next track should be attacked once your foundation track has been completed. This is like the glue that holds things together, the electrical, plumbing, and other glue that holds your program together. And then there's the essential track. Now, at this point, there's a reason why I've underlined foundation, core, and essential. And there's probably something that should be bothering you about these terms. And I'll just go ahead and point it out to you because this is um, intentional that you would be bothered, is that they are more or less synonymous with each other. In other words, even though we're recommending that you start here, none of this is optional. Right? You, you have to meet all the requirements of the rules. It's not like you can ignore some of the requirements. So, you know, the essential uh, track is as important as the foundation track, but you got to start somewhere, right? And, and we're giving you places to start. So you, you can say, yeah, that makes sense. I think I'll start there. Or, you know what, I'm going to modify, I'm going to move this into the foundation because for our organization, we think that's more important and we think we have this other thing covered. It's just an approach. As required, really, it's going to depend largely on your organization's operational environment, you know, how much mobile do you have, how much social media do you have, how much interaction in the cloud do you have, 
we have a, a, a uh, cloud social media and mobile checklist that has a set of requirements. It's really a, a sub checklist of the other checklists, but that, those tracks are going to be really dependent on your organization. Although today I can't really see an organization that doesn't have mobile, social media, or cloud, so really these are required as well. Okay. I'm taking a breath again. I'm Martin, I'm assuming since you hadn't interrupted that there are no questions. Remember now, I know some people have arrived late. The questions don't have to have don't have to be anything related to this agile stuff. We are uh, announcing here first that on Fridays at three o'clock, um, every Friday at three o'clock, we're going to run a, a half hour webinar where uh, it'll be an Ask Carlos Anything, Ask Me Anything webinar, and we will explore a particular piece of the privacy rule, a particular piece of the security rule, uh, and sort of do a deep dive, but the opportunity will be for people to really ask ask me anything, and, and even something that's off topic, it takes us two or three times to get through the topic, that's fine. We're going to start that every Friday at 3 o'clock uh, going forward. Um, Starting with next Friday, you'll see an announcement in our newsletter uh, where to find out how to how to click to and get registered for that particular uh, webinar or mini webinar. Not not sure exactly yet what we're going to call it. So with that, does anybody have a question? And ask me anything question. There's nothing here yet, Carlos. Um... It's quite an invitation, so I'm sure someone will take advantage of the Ask Anything part. Well, I'm not surprised, actually, because when we when we ran this webinar for our subscribers, that was the first webinar we ever did, but there were absolutely no questions. And part of the reason was we think that this is so foreign to uh, what people have experienced that I, I think people, uh, a lot of people just don't know where to even begin to ask a, a, a question, but that's okay, uh, because it is foreign and it is something that we've borrowed from other industries, and we believe you're going to hear a lot more of uh, this agile compliance. So here's a chunk, okay? Assuming you have model policies, policies that you've gotten from us or policies that you've gotten from another vendor. By the way, you can apply agile no matter who you're partnering with, who your vendor is. You know, it's, it's, it's a philosophy. It's a methodology. It's, uh, you know, we're just using our examples uh, to make it more concrete, right? This is a mini project plan. If you have model policies, you need to get them out into the organization. And what we recommend is that you uh, get people in the organization to sign the security rule policy, that they read it and understood it. Sign the privacy rule policy. I read it and understood it. Sign the breach notification policy and store it in your compliance repository. That's why we mean by present the model policies and get them distributed into your organization. Now, you know, first of all, you need to get executive team feedback, right? And then make some changes based on the feedback. Allow the executive team to review the final policies. Hopefully, you can say, look, we, we got this chunk. There's a million and one things we want to do. We want to get this turned around pretty quick. So please, you know, can we present these to you? They're not that complicated. You know, each policy is maybe three to four pages. Can you read it? Give us some feedback so we can get this thing distributed. Because this is 101. This is step 101. How are you going to sanction an employee for violating the privacy rule if the employee doesn't even understand what the privacy rule is? Now, it goes hand in hand that the next thing you should probably be doing is doing your training. Right? These are obviously obvious places to start. Right? Obvious, obvious places to get some traction. So distribute it through the organization, scan the results, put them in your compliance repository, ticky mark, documentation, you can go back to the privacy rule and say, hey, we did that, we did, we completed this chunk. What about training and awareness? Well, there's training required in the privacy rule, there's training required in uh, the security rule. We have a suite of training modules for the privacy rule, for security rule, for breach notification, for business associate. Get these rolled out. Decide who needs to attend what, okay? Uh, have key stakeholders go through the training, figure out is this training required for everybody or, or are we going to split the training and just the admin staff gets this, the clinical staff gets that. Uh, and after each training video, 
the core team should discuss the content. The videos are, our videos are about an hour long or hour and 15 minutes. The longest one is the privacy rule. It's an hour and a half. Okay, so theoretically the core team, three or four people could get through a couple of videos a day. You know, you, you, uh, you do that in the week. You say, okay, here's how we're going to do it. And then you can start scheduling your training and get that rolled out. There's also a test, a quiz, and an answer key that we provide for every training module. So, you know, you say part of our policy is that you need to get at least a 70% on each training. And if you don't get a 70%, then you retake it, right? And you can sort of uh, modify the, the, the quizzes a little bit so that the retakes aren't um, so drop that easy because people are just memorizing what the answers are. But the way we see it, it's an open slide test. If you've been paying attention to the training, you ought to be able to get 70%. You, you, you log that, uh, and you, you can take that ticket mark and say, we, we've done our training. So depending on the size of your organization, obviously, that, that's going to uh, determine which workforce members participate in joint, tra in joint training and how long it's going to actually take to get everybody scheduled and through the program. Okay, but you can see that the, the training and awareness chunk or mini project plan was a little more complex than just roll out the policies. The policies were pretty straightforward, but neither one is really overwhelming. You can get your mind around this. This is what you got to do. Get these, you know, get your get your training program rolled out. Now, you know, it's going to be hard to make a good faith argument that your organization is up to speed on the High Tech Act and all of its requirements. If you haven't gotten your policies out there and signed, you haven't trained your folks, right? It's just going to be almost impossible to make a good faith argument. So these are obviously places to start. So what what I just showed you were two examples of the what we're calling the foundation track. Okay, you have tracks, and then each track has a one-to-many relationship with chunks. I just gave you showed you two chunks that go with the foundation track. And each chunk has one or more tasks that you do. So for us, it looks like this. We've defined four tracks, a foundation track, a core track, an essential track, an as required track. And we are in the process. We've completed the foundation chunks, and they're available on our subscription site. We are going to complete all chunks for the core track, the essential track, and the as required track so that you'll have a complete set. Is this everything you have to do? No. It's all to get you off the ground and rolling deep, pretty deep into your program, and at least as far as being able to make a good faith argument that you are not in willful neglect land because you are definitely making progress that you can track. And that's the key. You're making progress that is trackable. Now, because this, this is agile, and because the most important thing you can get out of this particular webinar is to get started. If you don't like our tracks, fine. Pick a track, pick a chunk, get started. That's the message you ought to take away, right? If our tracks don't make sense because you've already done the foundational training, you've already rolled out your policy, just pick a chunk, pick a track, get started, make progress. So tracks and requirements there's a one to many relationship again requirements something mandated by law tracks and chunks again one to many relationship here's what we define as the foundation track your model policies your training and awareness the definition of an actual deployment of your compliance repository ensuring that you got your business associate agreements in place and, and those relationships how you're going to deal with business associates not only the agreements, but what happens if there's a breach, et cetera, et cetera. Risk assessment, because you can't pass the meaningful use objective uh, 15, I, I believe it is, uh, it, unless you've done a risk assessment. So any meaningful use dollars that, you're, that you would like to get are in jeopardy if you haven't done a risk assessment. Now, we have our, our privacy rule security will cover this in its entirety. What we're doing to you is give, what we're giving you here is many project plans that refer back security incidents. How on earth can you convince HHS that you're meeting the breach notification requirement if you don't have a way to report and track security incidents? It's an impossibility, right? You can't even make you couldn't even make that argument with a straight face. And I probably would tell you if I was your counsel, you know what? You know, we're just going to admit that. 
that we're not doing it and throw ourselves at the mercy of HHS because there's no way if you're not if you haven't rolled out a way to report and track and analyze security incidents, how can you possibly determine whether or not one of these incidents should have led to notification? You can't. Okay, so this is our um, uh, foundation track. These chunks are already defined and available in our repository. When I mean in our repository, I mean if you sign up for our subscription, you can get these. Next that we're working on is core risk management actually swallows everything, but in the security rule, it is defined in a particular way. And again, if you looked at risk management in a global sense, well, that would be everything. That's one way to define it. And that's how I defined it in the beginning. It swallows the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule, but you can't really tackle it like that because you can't get your mind around that. You gotta start somewhere. You gotta start with foundation and build on that. Disaster recovery, breach notification, intrusion detection. These are ones that we suggest you attack next. Essential, how do you grant PHI access? Right? What is the process? Is there, there's a due process. You gotta do something, you have to do something within 30 days. If you can't make it within 30 days, you gotta have written notice to the patient asking them, hey, we can't make it for 30 days, but we can make it in 35. There's a whole due process, what we call in our privacy rule checklist, the patient's bill of rights that you've probably never implemented before because nobody uh, used to ask for their PHI, and if you did, you'd get away with ignoring them because they weren't even aware that, that they could get it. They weren't even aware that you could, that you had to provide it within 30 days. That's all changed. That's all changing. I just read yesterday that the California Attorney General sued some, sued a covered entity, I believe it was a covered entity, LinkedIn is messed up right now, so you can't click on uh, group posts and actually see the the post. But um, for late for late breach notification, didn't meet the breach notification requirement of 60 days. Okay, and it's not surprising that California uh, would be the first um, attorney general to bring that kind of suit because privacy is really. Um, because California is a, a thought leader in the privacy space. A lot of what happens in California eventually filters one way or the other to uh, the rest of the country. But you uh, expect to see more AGs found these kind of lawsuits on behalf of their citizens. The states are starving for revenue, uh, and the heat is being turned up on compliance. So, and again, we talked about as required, social media, cloud, mobile, depending on where you're at and what you have. Now, how do you track this? All right? Yes, you got to do these chunks, but at the end of the day, an auditor is not going to say, well, you know, they don't know what a chunk is. They're going to say, did you meet, did you meet requirements such and such to the privacy rule? This is our privacy rule checklist items that covers, we think, the entire privacy rule, right? So you get our checklist. Once you're done with a chunk, you should be able to come back here and say, you know what? We now have a methodology in place for determining when the privacy rule has been violated. In fact, our checklist gives you a methodology, okay? So if you want to sanction an employee, right? First of all, you can't sanction an employee legitimately if you don't if they've never read the policy and you never ask them to read the policy. You can't really sanction an employee legitimately if they've never been trained. Right? If they have been trained um, and they have signed the policy, you can't really sanction them if you don't have any kind of methodology for determining how do you go about determining how they violated the rule. Why is that important? Because that, if, 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 the, if the employee would have challenged that in court, that's going to be your defense mechanism. This is our process. This is how we determine that the rule has been violated. And uh, unless you've ever explored this question, it's really important uh, in the breach notification sense because there is no breach notification unless the privacy rule has been violated. Okay? By definition, if the privacy rule wasn't violated, then there's no breach by definition. But answering or figuring out whether there's been a violation of the privacy rule is, in fact, quite complex. Okay, but if you hadn't done these chunks, you really can't get here, right? So you might be able to say if you've done your model policies and your training, you know what? 
Yeah, we really haven't completed this because we, you know, we're not completely through with figuring out how what we're going to, you know, uh, sort of swallowing this concept about how we're going to go about determining if the rules have been violated. We got a little bit more work to do based on, you know, what's been provided. But we think we, you know, we can maybe give this a two. We got ba we got the basics in place. We have trained our people and we have um, distributed the policies. This is authorization, it's the identification, minimum necessary, opportunity to agree and object, public policy disclosures. These are all requirements of the um, privacy rule, and to some degree or another, the chunks are going to address these requirements. Same thing with the security rule. Okay? So the scorecard is how is your mechanism for talking to the boss, the executive team, in order for law. Where are you? You can show progress by clicking off these areas, and you can also show what's left to do, right? Because obviously in places where there's no, where there is a zero, that means that it's missing, right? You should have nothing. Here's, here's a, a, a uh, little strategy for you, right? Especially if you're a consultant or an attorney or the privacy officer, security officer, and it's your uh, butt that's on the line here is you should never have a zero here. You should at least have planned a one. Hey, we haven't done it, but we're aware of that requirement. We just haven't gotten there yet. How are you aware of it? Well, we've been through this checklist, and we know we have to do that. So we're informed. You know, we're not throwing our nose in the law. Uh, the law. We're informed, but we haven't gotten there yet, right? So that's what I would do. I would put a one after you get through the privacy rule, the security rule, the breach notification rule, after you've gotten your sort of, you know, undergrad degree and part of your master's in HIPAA compliance. You can go put a one. You know you got to get to these, I would put at least a one. You've got to score, but then you can uh, uh, show progress on. Same thing is true for cloud, social media, and mobile. We have a checklist here. They're what we think are the requirements. They're really sub-requirements, but they're nuanced enough that we have split it out. Okay? So the chunks, when you complete a chunk, are then going to come back and you're going to update that on the scorecards as a way of keeping score. What's the most important takeaway from the webinar today? Get busy. Get busy. Get started. Okay? And it's not the work in progress that causes the biggest delay in these kind of projects. It's not. It's the decisions in progress. It's waiting for what kind of decision. Who are we going to partner with? When are we going to start? All those things are the things that cause analysis and paralysis and that a year and a half later you still haven't made the progress that you should make, okay? Because you haven't gotten through, not the work, the work shouldn't have taken that long. You haven't gotten through the, des the decisions that need to be made in order for the work to be carried out. So for you math heads, this is a little equation for you. Let me run through it and see if anybody... Uh, if this helps anybody, if it doesn't, just throw it away. But this is kind of based on um, second law of thermodynamics. And S stands for entropy. K is a universal constant known as Boltzmann's constant. And Boltzmann was a German physicist circa 1880s, really world-renowned. And he's got this little equation on his gravestone. Okay, so this was his contribution to the universe. Um, w has to do with the number of ways in which parts of a complex system can be arranged at the start. So we're dealing with a complex problem here. It, it, we're dealing with a wicked problem here. How are you going to get this HIPAA compliance thing launched? It's enormously complex if you look at it in its entirety. Okay, so when you're confronting any complex problem, the number of possible ways that the solution space could be arranged approaches infinity. In other words, it's a really, 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 really big freaking number, the number of ways you could arrange these things. Okay? The W, is therefore, is quite large. Therefore, the solution space is in the state of maximum entropy, right? And that's the second law of thermodynamics says that everything tends toward a state of entropy or randomness, right? So order is imposed and entropy is reduced by reducing the number of decisions in progress, the DIP. Really, 
How does that work? Okay. Here's how I think it works. By making intelligent, methodical, relentless decisions. Not arbitrary. You're going to analyze. You're going to make a, 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 an informed decision, but make it after you taking the time to get informed. After you make intelligent, methodical, and relentless decisions, constraints are imposed. Okay? As constraints are imposed, the number of possible arrangements of this complex system is reduced. The W gets smaller. Order increases and entropy decreases. That's why getting busy, getting started um, are the keys to Agile. You have to reduce the complexity of the solution space. So you need you'll never make any progress. So in this case, the best is not just the enemy of the good. The best is the enemy, period. Do more, study less. Patch first, ask questions later. So embrace the chaos. That whole thing that we went through about all the disruption that you're seeing, if you're a compliance professional, you're going to see so much change in the next 20 years. Uh, that it's going to be hard to believe how you got through it. If you're trying to survive, if you're trying to survive as a privacy officer and a security officer in that kind of change environment, you're going to need to embrace the chaos because I can guarantee you that things are not going to return to normal in our lifetime in the healthcare industry. No way, no how. The horse is out of the barn, and you know it's a race for God knows where. But we're not going back to where we've been. So. Eating our own dog food. Once you get Agile, you start applying it almost to everything you do. So Agile is how we develop our hip survival products. We iterate, we iterate, we iterate. We get started, we proof it, we run it by different people, we run it by people in the marketplace, and then we put it out there, all right? Because the marketplace will tell us how to improve it. We practice law using an Agile iterative methodology. In, in many ways, law is just another way of it's it's a it's it's a publishing business for the most part. You know, it, it, most people think that lawyers all spend most of the time in court, but ninety nine percent of the time that a lawyer spends is writing stuff, publishing stuff. You know, motions and arguments and you know yada yada. It is uh, it, it, law is definitely by definition a complex, wicked problem, and you know it, it, this agile applies to the practice of law. So. What is Agile? It's a project management methodology that can apply to almost any complex problem you can think of. Iterate, iterate, iterate. Once you get this, uh, you will start applying it to almost everything you do, including projects at home. <laughs> so here's our shameless plug. Make you all know we have a, a pro a products that we sell. The real product, um, from our perspective, is a subscription plan where you get all our products. For seventy ninety five, the first year renewal years are optional, and those are four ninety five. But you get every product you see on our store, every training product, our checklist, these chunks, and uh, these things that we talked about today are made uh, are available only to our subscribers. Uh, so you can't buy that individually. Uh, you have to subscribe because it really doesn't make sense without the subscription. Because we're talking about here's how you solve it using our set of tools. So we think we provide the recipe and not just the ingredients, right? We're, we're, whereas the rules are all uh, descriptive, whereas the NIST documents drive you nuts with 20 questions, and they're descriptive as well. They're useful for a, a reference, but they really don't tell you what to do. That's what we try to do. We're trying to show you step one, step two, step three. This is how you can get through this. So we believe we provide wetware educational products you can start to execute on day one. We have the policies, we have the processes, we show you how for every policy and process how to track the results. And so if you go through this program, you should be on your way to producing BDE, visible demonstrable evidence, and you should have no uh, not much problems showing HHS or court of law that you are on your way to establishing a culture of compliance except no substitute. So now we're at Q&A. Again, you guys can ask any questions about Agile. You can ask questions about anything else related to HIPAA high tech. As of right now, we still don't have any questions, Carlos, but I would like to pose a question out there to those 
uh, for our Friday half-hour seminars on topics, if they would be kind enough to email us what bothers them the most and what they need to know about. I think that would make a more effective give and take on all of our parts. Again, no questions. Well, let me ask. Let me let me ask a question. Since there's no questions, we really aren't surprised that there aren't any questions. How, how many? And you can just type in, you know, whether this applies to you. How many of you are privacy officers, compliance officers? How many? How many of you are, are consultants or business associates? Martin, are you getting any numbers? We have a software developer. Yeah, so a software developer is kind of a specialized business associate, and you know, um, and, and if you're a SaaS, what you're developing is is on the cloud. You have additional things that you really need to comply with because then you really, really you got to comply with the security rule because yeah. um, because you're the host, right? And you probably should be um, looking for ways to encrypt as much PHI. Uh, as you can, because if you encrypt everything you need to encrypt, then you take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. And if you encrypt according to HHS protocols, then uh, there is no breach that can happen by definition. So, um, okay, any lawyers out there? We have well, we have a SAS. Uh, we also have a security officer for a state governmental agency. Okay. All right. Well, then, so, you know, we got, what time is it here? I don't know. We got like 10 minutes. You SAS guys want to ask some SAS questions? That's fine. You can ask me anything on these sessions. Come on. You got to be wondering about something. Whose business associate agreement is being signed? I work with some SAS vendors from a my law firm's perspective and right if you're going to scale a SaaS business then if you're spending all your time running around trying to get business associate contracts signed or if you're not treating them like business associate contracts uh, or, then you got a real problem so you got, you got most of the time the SaaS vendors are having uh, for example Microsoft in their office 360 offer and they're you're signing no matter how big a covered entity you are, you're signing Microsoft's um, BA agreement. Now, Microsoft might make a, an exception, you know, if it's Kaiser Permanente or somebody, but for the most part, they don't want to spend all the time dealing with 100 million different uh, or 100,000 or 200,000 different associate agreements, so they force their customers to sign theirs. And the BAs that I work with, that's that's kind of that we're going about it. You, know, the, you have to sign the SAS vendors business associate, which is really part of the I agree registration process before you pay your money. You click I agree and you're agreeing to lots of different things, but you're also agreeing to the business associate that's been embedded in the terms of use. So um, yeah, SAS vendors have a number of complex things they need to deal with. Okay. Um in terms of encryption in place, I hear contradictory things regarding HIPAA. Is it your assessment it's required along with encryption under transmission? In place in place on an otherwise right, let me give you a server. Yeah, let me give you a two part answer. The security rule doesn't mandate it. It's an it's an addressable requirement. Okay, so it, it's not mandated, but if you don't encrypt the data, then you can't take advantage of the the safe harbor. All right, you, you, you got to go prove. There is no there is no argument that says you know what we encrypted according to the protocol, so there can't be a breach by definition. And you couldn't have gotten anything. It's an impossibility. And those protocols are NIST protocols that were recommended back in two thousand and nine. So if you, you you're using those protocols or better to encrypt, you can take advantage of the safe harbor. If you don't take advantage of the safe harbor and you don't encrypt, well, then you have to answer the question, was not encrypting reasonable and appropriate? Those are the 
weasel words that we get back to that are in the security rule throughout the security rule. I'm going to make an argument to you that a class action law firm suing you in a state for negligence is going to make the argument that not encrypting was not reasonable and appropriate. It was negligent. You should have encrypted. You didn't encrypt. There are encryption algorithms out there. You're now negligent under state law. So, yes, the answer is yes. There is some uh, confusion out there, mostly because uh, encryption is not a, a, a uh, required implementation specification under the security rule. It's, a, it's an addressable one. But I don't think it's really going to help you if you don't do it. So the, the balance of the question was against uh, you know encryption versus a secure server, firewalls, logins, etc. So yeah, I that's not sufficient. That's necessary, but not sufficient. I mean, the, the the security rule tells you to do all that, right? That that would be that's definitely reasonable and appropriate, right? That's like IT one hundred and one. Got to have a firewall in place, DMC in place, all that. But you know, that's clearly reasonable and appropriate, you know, but is that enough? No, it's not enough. I mean, it's not enough. I mean, you're taking a chance. If you encrypt, you can take advantage of the safe harbor. If you don't encrypt, you're at the mercy of what is reasonable and appropriate. And that's what I'm saying. This is now a legal argument. I, I, I can assure you what my brethren are going to argue. I've already told you. They're going to argue you're negligent. You should have encrypted. You didn't encrypt. That's why these millions of records got, uh, you know, uh, released. Now pay, pay my clients some money. That's how the argument is going to go. There, you can't have a private suit under HIPAA. That's why all these class action lawsuits are happening in the states under negligence law. And that's going to be the neg that is the reasonable person standard negligence. Did you do what a reasonable person would have done under similar circumstances? That's the negligence standard. That's the duty. Did you do what was reasonable and appropriate? What a reasonable uh, person would have done. Those are the same weasel words that are now, uh, not not just now, that have been in the security rule for a long time. And that's how you're going to get sued in state court on a theory of negligence. And they're just going to use HIPAA to reinforce their argument on why you should be found negligent. I mean, that's how that's going to work. Every time you see one of these major breaches, there's going to be a class action lawsuit um, and probably we're never going to see an opinion come out of it because they're going to they're going to settle. They're going to settle because there's so much damage to the reputation of the vendors. They don't want this thing uh, all over Pacer and publicly available. So, okay, Martin, are we good? We're good. We've got all the questions in. Whoa, 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 whoa. Here we go. Just to clarify. We clarify on the we clarify on the client's machines and encrypt the data in transmission to the cloud. The trade-off here is specifically with encrypting in place on the server with regard to the performance hit under scale. But you've definitely convinced me encryption in place on the server is worth it to reduce exposure. Thanks. Well, we have a thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you don't want to send protected health information in clear text over the wire because it's just too easy to snoop nowadays, right? That's like a gimme for the bad guys. I mean, the bad guys are smart. The bad guys are really, really good. The bad guys are in places like whatever, the Ukraine, and we can't even get jurisdiction over those guys. So if you don't encrypt over the wire, you're just exposing that, right? And they're going to figure it out. That's just an, e just, an, just an easy target if you don't encrypt over the wire. So, you know, the... Using secure connections, that would be the only way. If I was a SaaS vendor, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to tell my customers I'm not encrypting over the wire. That's got to be a, a, a secure connection. I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it, there are performance hits, right? So that's the that's the challenge, right? There are, there are definitely performance hits. Uh, here's a question. If only personal information is, is disclosed, is this a breach under HIPAA? No, just merely sending clear text over the internet over a wire, the mere act is not a violation. 
right? Somebody's got it because there's been no there's been no violation of the privacy rule. Who who's intercepted it? You know what I mean? If nobody intercepted it, well, you just got lucky, right? I mean, maybe you can get lucky for five or ten years, and nobody catches on that you're transmitting large amounts of DHI over the wire unsecured. Just the fact that you're doing that is not a violation. You got somebody's actually got to get at the data, look at it, and and it was breached. So I mean, that, that that's a good question because people get people get confused. The mere act. Of sending uh, or the mere act of non encrypting or mere, mere act of sending PHI over clear text over the over the wire. That's no, that's not a violation. And, and you know that, that, that's why the breach notification. You really do have to have a methodology for understanding when breach is triggered. The first step is: was there a violation of the privacy rule? If the answer to that is yes, then you say, okay, was there any exceptions that apply? There are some exceptions built into the definition of breach. If there's no exceptions that apply. Then you have to make the argument: Was there a low probability that the PHI was compromised? Good luck making that argument. If you get to that step, you're probably at breach. And further, the omnibus rule said it's presumed to be a breach. So you have an ex any business associate or covered entity that wants to make that argument of low probability has a huge uh, problem rebutting rebutting the presumption of breach that is now built into the definition. Uh, that this question was uh, the follow-up question I just gave was from a different person asking if only personal information is disclosed, and I think what we're talking about here is name, address, and address without healthcare information. I, I... Well, you know that's that's sort of an age-old HIPAA question: name, address, and, and and yeah, okay, but that's identifying, and if I know it was coming from uh, you know um, Morton Plant Cancer Center. Then yeah, I, I put two and two together. I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue you violated because the you know if it's coming from this particular cancer center, that's probably uh, you know the high probability that these patients have cancer. So you know, there you go. That's all we have for now. All right. Thanks for participating, guys. Sorry about the problems later. We're going to build our own redundancy so that we uh, can screen approve this process. Uh, stay tuned to our newsletter for announcements. You can, there will be an Ask Me Anything every Friday. You can uh, drop in as you see fit. Thank you.